Watch Mojo is a top 50 YouTube channel with 15 billion all time views and 35 million subscribers. Who better then to talk about the evolution of digital storytelling, marketing, and media? Ash has agreed to share his success stories with us, as well as his personal insight into the current state of the digital media, what crisis management means in the era of COVID-19, and his vision for the future of the, of the industry. Joining him in conversation is Julian McKenzie, another successful Concordia grad earning his BA in 2016. Julian is a respected freelance journalist, broadcaster, and podcaster. He can be found delivering weather at CTV Montreal, doing sports center updates at TSN 690 Montreal, and writing for the Canadian Press Newswire, the Montreal Gazette, 538.com, and Yahoo Sports Canada. Additionally, as you'll soon see, he's also hosted videos and written scripts for Watch Mojo, so he's a perfect person to guide the discussion. Julian and Ash will have the floor for about 40 minutes, and then we'll open um, questions up to the audience. We've received some great questions, to, um, so we hope to address those in our presentation. However, again, the chat box is where we encourage you to enter general comments as well as questions for our speaker. So Julian, I'll think, hand things over to you. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for, for joining Ash and myself on uh, this webinar. We uh, really appreciate you taking the time. And I also uh, am humbled and honored to be able to to moderate this conversation with a, a man I, I very much respect, someone who has given me so many chances early on as I make my way through my, my journalism and media career. And and uh, we've also uh, done uh, Watch Mo Watch Mojo videos together. So this is a, a bit of a different change now, it's, as opposed to doing a video for YouTube clicks, we're, we're doing a video for, for people in the know who want to know a little bit more about what's going on in the digital media landscape. So before I dive into my questions, Ash, how are you doing, man? I haven't seen you in a while. I hope you're doing okay. I hope the family as well. Just kind of let everyone know how you've been handling uh, the pandemic. Sure. I mean, I think we've been very lucky and fortunate. Obviously, uh, you know, we emphasize the physical well-being of our team, uh, the mental well-being of everybody, and then just ensuring that the company could uh, continue to operate and grow. And so we've had a very good year. And I think if this year wasn't a reminder of our good fortune and privilege, then, you know, something's wrong with us because we really, uh, looking around, realize just how lucky we've been this year. Ash, uh, a lot of people like to know your success story they like to know the origins kind of like how people feel about superheroes in a way not to say you're necessarily a superhero but you know what i mean you studied social sciences and the humanities before jumping into business at concordia and uh, you were a content creator at askmen.com before becoming as you as you referred to yourself as a reluctant entrepreneur how did all of that lead to the success that we know now for watchmojo.com Interesting. I mean, I think 2020 will probably go down as the year of the outsider and the underdog. Uh, what started with Me Too, amplified this year with the Black Lives Matter. Look at Joe Biden, you know, third time he ran for president. So in many ways, uh, I, I was a bit of an outsider. Um, and as confident as I was, I was also a bit of an underdog. Um, everything from starting with going to Concordia uh, in, in Montreal, pursuing entrepreneurship. I mean, you do have a bit of a chip on your shoulder where you want to prove to yourself and to others. And so I, I think that like you've read probably that like when you get a you know disappointing outcome, if you lose, if the ball doesn't bounce your way, you, you do have to remain positive and understand that there might be a better uh, opportunity around the corner. Now, that doesn't mean that it will fall on your lap. You have to go for it. So I think at every step of my career, um, I managed to take what was a, probably a near-term negative or threat or weakness and turn it into a positive and open up new opportunities for, for myself professionally and personally. So in terms of more specifics, in terms of uh, how you were coming up to, to the point you are with Watch Mojo, like what exact, did you always have that idea in mind when you were in school? Like how, how did that idea come to you to create the YouTube channel? Sure. So, I mean, I grew up reading uh, a lot of magazines, encyclopedias, you know, watching TV like others. And then I thought I wanted to, you know, when I went into business, it was just to keep my options open. I studied finance thinking that I could do other fields, but I was always drawn to history. I was always very much like a biographer and researcher interested in how people kind of overcame adversity to have success. So eventually um, I gravitated to the world of startups instead of pursuing a career in investment banking or consulting. And then once I came into the world of startups, I realized I was more passionate about media content and storytelling 
than just technology. So one reason why I was drawn to Ask Men was because I wanted to write. And so I ended up working at Ask Men for five years and really splitting up my time between uh, business duties, deal making, partnerships, as well as a columnist and interviewer, very much some of the things you're doing. You know, so when I when I see your career path, I'm like, yeah, I get that, you know, wanting to stay kind of a not a free agent, but versatile and, you know, keep your options open. And I really respect the, uh, in, in how you've done that. And so when eventually IGN Entertainment, News Corporation acquired uh, Ask Men, I was 27 and I really felt that I wanted to continue down this path of storytelling. And I didn't want to just reinvent the wheel and keep writing articles. I, I felt I had done that. Uh, and I felt that the world of storytelling was going to move to video and mobile devices. And so we decided to launch Watch Mojo to basically recapture the people and things that audiences have always read and been passionate about, but in video format, but in a form length style that would make sense for online consumption, where you have a shorter attention span. So in 2006, we literally said, let's be very horizontal, automotive, business, comedy, health, fashion, travel, entertainment. And we were doing all different formats. You know, we were doing top 10 lists, but we we're also doing Q and A's. We we're doing biographies, profiles, deep dives, essays. And admittedly, we just got to a point where we said, you know what, what are we really good at? Ranking, comparing, pop culture. What are we probably best at? Research, factual, you know, objective um, content kind of scripted in the sense that it's research, but it's not really scripted like comedy or drama. And we had like also this feeling that, you know, kids who grew up reading comic books would grow up, you know, being decision makers on Madison Avenue and Hollywood and, um, you know, everywhere else, you know, Wall Street and Silicon Valley. And then they would start to make decisions where all of a sudden somehow Iron Man and Batman would be weaved into a cereal box or a movie. And so we just felt that um, in the end, we should then go fish where the fish are. So it's not enough to get a good content strategy. You got to marry content, maybe king. I say distribution is queen. <laughs> and context, where you engage with that content is, is kind of the marriage of content and distribution. And so we felt that YouTube was really this kind of once in a generation, you know, redefining platform that was going to just change media. And today, you know, you would argue that Netflix and YouTube have been respectively evolutionary and revolutionary um, in terms of just how we consume content and the kind of content that we watch. So from 2006 to 12, it was still very much experimentation, trial, tinkering. And then 2011, 12, we kind of felt we had the formula down and then we put our head down and executed. And, you know, as they say, all overnight successes are 10 years in the making. Took us a while, but then eventually we built a, a pretty nice business. I wanted to know more about the process of trying to come up with different ideas and in that experimentation phase. I, I kind of liken stuff like that, whether you're pitching an idea, uh, it gets shot down or whether it works or not, as kind of like when you're making spaghetti and you're throwing spaghetti at the wall and if it sticks, then it works. What's it like uh, coming up with a company and coming up with different ideas? I can think of a few off the top of my head. Shows like the lineup, which you had produced uh, for Watch Mojo, which was a hockey. I think it was like a sports quiz show. Uh, there was like a partnership briefly with the New York Islanders as well. There were different ideas that, that kind of came up over the last few years with Watch Mojo. What's it been like just trying to come up with new ideas and, and new ways of, of putting out content uh, and seeing stuff that works and seeing stuff that doesn't work in the so-called Eric's experimentation phase? Yeah. So, I mean, I think throwing spaghetti against the wall is maybe a bit more random. And while there is an element of randomness, I, I compared more to just like a mad scientist kitchen. There is a little bit of a method to the madness, but admittedly as an entrepreneur, you go with instinct, you go with your gut, and then you surround yourself with people who bring a bit of order to that chaos. Right. And then what you want is that balance, right? Like you're not going to cook pasta in cold water. You're not going to try to boil a lobster uh, in milk, right? Like my point is you still need to have a little bit of a, a method to the madness. And indeed though, it is ingredients and recipes and tinkering and heat. And there's a lot of those things that are out of your control, right? Like for us, I go luck and timing are critical. We had to, uh, we could have had the same strategy, but five years before, if YouTube wasn't where it was, maybe it would not have worked, et cetera, et cetera. But so to, to your main point question, I think the CEO 
or the founder has a role in an organization, which is admittedly to always kind of come up with ideas and, you know, never become jaded. You know, like if, if I have a colleague who will kind of come out and throw, we had a colleague just a, earlier this week say, hey, should we reach out to Nike or Adidas? And, you know, this rapper just tweeted at us and basically partner with the rapper and Nike or Adidas and come up with a watch mojo kind of inspired and this artist inspired shoe. A lot of people in my shoes, no pun intended, could have been like, that's a crazy idea. It's a waste of time. Just get back to your work. That's not me. I'm like, you know what? I had a conversation with Nike. It didn't go anywhere. But you know what? If you want to take a stab at it, go. Here's the ball. Go for it. Surprise me. Maybe there's, you know, the timing is different. Maybe you're going to have a better. So you have to stay open. You want to ask critical questions and not just be like, sure, like a sheep but you never want to be jaded. You know, it's fine to be a bit cynical, but if you're so cynical that you're annoying and then you just turn off your team, you're not going to be successful, right? And the reality is, I mean, in marketing, we study like product life cycles and there's like infancy, embryonic and development and growth and then mature and then decline. The only way you avoid the decline phase is, is by the time something becomes mature, you start, you go back in your kitchen and you start to tinker, you put some ingredients together. You know, I like to cook some of my best dishes kind of were, salvage from something that was going to get off the rails right so you actually have to always be like a dreamer you know i've always said it that the day when i become just no 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 we can't do this that's a bad idea you suck this sucks we suck that day i should hang up the skates and uh you know give the opportunity to somebody else to be the the de facto leader of the company was there an idea uh that you really pushed hard to make work that you really believed in that just didn't work? And is there another idea of yours of all the different ideas you've had uh, where maybe you thought, hey, you know what? I'm not sure if this will work. Let's just see. And then it ended up being better than you expected. Just kind of putting you on the spot in terms of sure. uh, the content you've put out. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that took longer and then, then they, they did go on to become successful. Our entire international strategy, people thought I was crazy. You know, like Watch Mojo Espanol was just like a pain in the butt to, to execute. But at a very young age, I lived in Madrid and I travel when I can to, you know, uh, Latin American uh, countries and I, I play soccer with, you know, Spanish speaking guys. So I always had this like admittedly a personal affinity to just have a you know, a presence in, in Latin America and, and Spanish speaking countries. But as a business decision, I thought it made sense as well. But trying to figure out how to adapt our videos in different languages, starting with Spanish was, was a bit of a pain in the butt to address. And I kind of had to tinker until we found the model and then we could kind of scale it, right? But that took a few years. Um, whereas it would have been easy to just say, screw this. Miss Mojo, we had, you know, it was, I always had an idea to say, look, if Watch Mojo serves 80% male uh, viewers, stereotypes aside, I think 2020 is a great period where people could be themselves, you know, if, if you identify, you know, differently than when you were born or, or whatever, it's, it's a great time for individuals to just be comfortable in their own skin. And I got two daughters, if they grow up to like Megadeth and game uh, gaming, it's more power to them. But I think if you take a step back, historically, statistically, you're like, okay, there are some con content topics that have skewed towards a female demographic and etc. Um, so we said, look, eventually we should probably have something like Miss Mojo. But I said, look, how is this going to be received? It's not like 50 or 100 years ago when Hearst had Mademoiselle or Elle. You're coming out with something called Miss Mojo in 2015, which may not be well greeted. Your intentions may not be perceived the way you want them. On day one, we had a lot of criticism. You guys are, you know, old school stereotyping, gendering, I'm just bad accusations. You know, I wearing the ombudsman role, I replied to pretty much everybody. I said, give us time. And today, if you look at the, the community comments, it's a fantastic positive vibe and it served its role. It gave a safe spot to people who wanted us to cover topics that historically would just not have resonated on Watch Mojo. But it took a little bit of conviction, confidence, courage, but that doesn't mean that you're right and everybody is wrong. It means reading the room. It means asking people. You know, you you have never really worked, I think, full time, uh, unfortunately, at Watch Mojo. But I sincerely believe the best idea can come everywhere. And maybe I believe that too much, where I realize, well, look, these these kids are kids. They don't have the experience. They may have a lot of wisdom, but you got to harness that and not just throw them in a pool and then walk away, right? But so, 
it's not, I mean, look, I've also had bad ideas that didn't work. You know, we tried live, live is hard. You know, there were cool events that we did live in New York and London, but I mean, were they successful? I mean, the, you know, success is relative, fluid and subjective. So, you know, the, the goal of the events and the Islanders was all to show we're not just a YouTube channel. And I'm the same way with people, you know, there's people who started working with me who at first were not necessarily just connecting. Um, but instead of just firing them, I said, you know what, let me just cast them in a different role. You know, maybe I've been playing them left wing, I'll put them on the right wing. Maybe they grew up as a defenseman. We got too many defensemen, maybe they should play the center. And I, some of our best employees are like that. You know, they were not, I don't want any credit, they in the end figured it out, but they would have been fired other places because people don't have that much patience with human beings, unfortunately, right? I mean, I know there's some questions regarding AI and robots. I think, you know, the, the if you're if you have empathy with people, every day you don't need to just have fancy schmancy slogans one day of the week you just always have to be nice with you know and, and humane so it's a long way of just saying you know what is success ambition vision execution persistence luck timing focus when you know what to focus on and resiliency uh, so i think a lot of it is timing right i would say most of our successes were probably not successes early on because things that are sustainable don't scale overnight and things that have scaled overnight don't tend to be sustainable. So it, I think it's a, it's a testament to remaining agile, tinkering, but being patient. You do need patience. There's no way around it. In business, anybody who thinks overnight success, go do something else. Let's talk about the current state of digital media. Uh, let's talk about storytelling specifically. Uh, it's, it seems to be your forte. What have you seen uh, amidst the pandemic and, and even maybe even leading up to that as well? I feel as if with the state of digital media as it is, it's so fluid. One minute you're seeing a whole bunch of video content, people pivoting to video. You're seeing the written content still out there, but you're still seeing the fluctuations in terms of jobs. I'm just kind of curious about what you've seen over the last little while on the front of digital media. I think the key macro trends is where we should start. So the, the media content storytelling universe has always been underwritten largely by a marketer or a sponsor. There's somebody, an invisible hand, that wants to piggyback next to content to sell you something commercial, ultimately. So advertising historically was strongest in TV but advertisers follow audiences and audiences have moved, you know, this, the, the, the cat's out of the bag, they've moved online. So until COVID, you actually had still a lot of inertia. You still had marketers going to Cannes, doing the upfronts, the schmoozing, the martinis, the, the Super Bowl tickets to grease the wheels. And so most of the ad dollars were still on TV. What now has accelerated is that the, the dam has been broken. You may watch Watch Mojo's content on your smart TV. You may watch Game of Thrones on your mobile device. So over time, the value between a viewer watching something on a mobile device and a, and a TV is going to converge. And there will just be more money in aggregate on digital. So you want to be on digital side, if, to be candid. Second, I think the main takeaway is just what cable did to network TV. So what MTV, ESPN, the travel channel did to NBC, ABC, CBS, and Fox is it eroded their market share. You might have heard that 30 years ago, if you wanted to reach 80% of Americans, you picked up the phone or your fax, and you basically placed an ad and you reached 80% of people on those networks. Time has changed. With cable, you had, you know, John Malone built TCI. He built the infrastructure of the cable industry, like literally fiber and, and all that in the ground and, and whatnot. But then eventually he launched Liberty Media because he needed content. But what cable did, those 500 channels, the web now has done to cable. There are essentially billions of websites and really pockets of interests. So you can, with the internet, actually build a big business by taking what seems to be a niche or niche topic. Yesterday, Peter Chernin, who was Rupert Murdoch's uh, lieutenant running Fox, now uh, he's an investor in media, Chernin Entertainment, 
So Mr. Chernin proceeded to invest $30 million in a surfing uh, content company, a company that just covers surfing, basically. That's, that's a business that historically would have been too small. But on the internet, you can go really deep and you could serve global surf fans. You know, uh, LVMH, the uh, luxury maker, invested $30 million or $40 million in a watch uh, merchant. You know, that's a lot of money to invest in a watch uh, e-tailer. But why? Because on the internet, you have access to global viewers. So if you are listening to this, it's, I would say, far more important. Somebody asked me favorite books, and I got a lot. I mean, if it's business, I do like the biographies on William Randolph Hearst. And even if I disagree with Rupert Murdoch, figuring out how previous entrepreneur storytellers built their business is always interesting because you also learn about history and the eras and politics and social culture and whatnot. But I would say a book that inadvertently had a big impact on me is as a business student, I ended up taking a ancient Greek philosophy class uh, and, and we read like Plato, Plato's Republic. Plato's Republic and his, his thoughts on the division of a society between philosophers, thinkers, you know, soldiers and, and common people and whatnot. You know, it, there's, there's nuances of that that are true, but mainly the whole concept of principle of specialization and comparative advantage, I would say is fundamentally true. And so that is what you have to figure out. You know, you always hear a lot of successful rich people talk about following your passion, but as other people have pointed out, those people made their fortunes in a very boring industry. You know, I was lucky. I always found a role in, in new industries that were developing and I created a job and I created a company around it. But not everybody can do that because you need a bit of business, a bit of content, a bit of everything. But the takeaway is this notion of comparative advantage. Find something where you either know more than others, like more than others, are willing to devote yourself more than others. And that's one checkbox. The other one is something where the demand and supply dynamics work in your favor. You like sports, I like sports. I started my career and under a pen name, I was writing uh, sports business articles. Who in your industry, not to put you on the spot, is synonymous now with the business of sports? I think of, uh, when you mean business of sports, you are you making orders in terms of about people who write about the content? People who write about it. Like I think of people like Richard Deitch, who is really into writing about broadcasters and companies uh, switching rights and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I think of uh, people who write for Sports Business Daily. There's a writer for the New York Post who's always writing about broadcasters changing hands in terms of the rights that they have or actual broadcasters changing places, like going from NBC to CBS. Like I'm, I'm really into that stuff. So okay. I think Darren, of those people. Darren, Darren Rovell, what's his name? His Darren name is Ravel. That's, that's also like the biggest dude. That's so, like a guy. I, mean, I think of him. Yeah. Okay. So when I started my career at Ask Men, I wrote a business uh, of sports column, which was pretty good. It got featured on uh, MSN. It got featured on, you know, but First of all, it was under a pen name. But the main point was I said, you know what? I don't want to be, I think of like, I, I think I use this line with you, Eminem and Kid Rock. Kid Rock used to think he was a rapper. They were both in Detroit. One day he heard of this other white rapper named Eminem. So he went to the record store. That's Spotify and Apple, iTunes before, you know, <laughs> before those existed. And he saw Eminem rap. And he was like, oh my God, I, Kid Rock, am not a rapper. But that guy is a rapper. And then he became a rocker. That's true story. I realized very early, I was like, man, I don't want to focus on one thing and go super deep and be like the Jesus Christ of just that thing. I was like a jack of, you know, jack of all trades, master of none. So for me, I wasn't going to make the sacrifice required to be the Darren Rovell of sports business, right? So I, but what I'm getting at is, I think today you could make a great living with all the tools that are out there, if you find a comparative advantage, find something where the demand supplies in your favor. If everybody wants to write about sports, it's gonna be hard to make a living because somebody's gonna come and do it cheaper, maybe even for free. And then you're kind of, you know, the, the, the rug gets pulled from underneath you. And then yes, something you're passionate about on top of that because it takes time. So you, when you're in the trenches, you don't wanna be miserable in life. But the point I'm getting at is, the web is this awesome platform that gives you global viewers uh, and all these tools. So there's in a way no excuse not to go for it. But I think sometimes some people 
don't necessarily know how to choose what that something to go for is. I had no clue about that Kid Rock Eminem story, by the way. That is, I had no clue about that. I'm, I'm also trying to picture you as some kind of like Kid Rock equivalent. And I can't do that because Kid Rock is just like, you two are just completely different sets of people. The, the takeaway there was not that I am the Kid Rock. And <laughs> I <Kid> know. <laughs> <laughs> If Still, that's the I, takeaway, we need to have a chat. No, I'm kidding. No, 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 no for sure. I think uh, obviously you being in the position that you're in with Watch Mojo uh, in the state in the state of digital media as it is, with all the billions of viewers that you've had on all the different channels, is an amazing position to be in. I'm just curious how you feel about your place in in the state of digital media as it is, where so many more eyeballs are, are flocking to their smartphones, their laptops as they are right now on this webinar. Thank you for that, by the way. Just curious how you feel about Watch Mojo's place uh, where a lot of people just kind of, you know, they look at the content that they have, they have the top tens, they have the comparative videos, they have some other stuff. How do you feel about that position? Well, it's like a kind of a loaded question. The, the reality is I, I do think I'm a pretty humble and modest person. Uh, and, and I still tell my team, look, we're the scrappy startup from Montreal. Nobody knows us. We have to go out there and finish every check. Literally nothing is, you know, nobody owes us anything. And yet everybody, even though we're unknown, everybody is gunning for us, right? So I do wake up sincerely thinking like that. But at the same time, you know, last year with the end of the decade and this year with the pandemic, I really kind of went a bit overboard on the whole like gratitude versus expectations. And as much as I'm an ambitious person and I want to accomplish a lot and do a lot of good, you know, it's easy to kind of fall into that kind of cycle where you're like, oh, you know, maybe I could have done more. Maybe we could do more. Um, and you got to balance that because then you start getting voices in your head and you're like, whoa, 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 Ash, you know, like it's things are good. You, you need to have perspective, right? You, you talk a lot about others having perspective. So you should start as well. I will say, though, that as much as luck and timing had a lot to do with it, you know, having had the foresight and the vision to come across like YouTube and recognize this is a bit different than everything else and go all in. And admittedly, uh, you know, risk it all, like not just my savings and whatever investments I had, but get a more like go into debt credit lines, then mortgage my place. You know, there's a there's my there's a visual where I'm sitting there at the notary mortgaging my condo to keep the company afloat in 2011. But I'm like, OK, like that could have turned out very differently. But look, we obviously have built what in some earnest ways like ESPN and MTV were building in the 80s on cable. You know, if I compare YouTube as the next cable, obviously we have a big brand that is well known and give credit to YouTube. The whole generation grew up on YouTube. And like I, I was joking before, you almost can't ignore us even if you wanted to. So I take a lot of pride in that. You know, we obviously fought a lot uh, for fair use. We fought a lot. You know, we literally helped YouTube write some of their policies, not literally if, if lawyers are listening, but like we literally lobbied and pointed out why their policies were not uh, reflecting copyright law and lobbied them diplomatically to update their policies, which they eventually did, uh, not doing us any favors, but just reflecting the law. So when I look at YouTube now, let's say whether I'm watching soccer clips or whether I see, you know, listen to music, I know that we played our part so that information can exist on the platform and rights holders don't abuse it. And those who comment and criticize and journalism, journalism for four years under President Trump was was under attack and journalists around the world are getting, you know, hacked and, and killed and, and whatnot. So as much as, you know, I don't take myself too seriously, we do take what we do at Watch Mojo seriously in that inform and entertain, uh, you know, mantle. And so I, I tell my team, I go, you guys should be very proud. You know, I, I was I get invited to go speak at conferences around the world and in many cities I'll get even like you know, journalism uh, professor, prof, uh, professors come to me and say, you know what, like we break down, you know, how media has changed. And when we look at YouTube, we always talk about Watch Mojo in terms of best practices and how polished the content looks. And I come back and I tell my team because they're the ones actually building the product day in, day out. So, you know, the, the answer is really balanced. On the one hand, I feel like we, we still have to kind of stay humble, modest and, and keep our heads down and just work and show up and every block and every tackle counts. But I'd be lying. It'd be false modesty to say that there's not like an immense source of pride for like how the team has has uh, you know managed to build and compete. Um, and you know it's different when you're an entrepreneur because you're literally the quintessential. You know you're not just like the the president and the GM and the coach of a team. You're a player. You're a captain. But sometimes you got to be on the bench and sometimes you're the janitor. 
And I think the most successful entrepreneurs are that, you know, they, they, they have just enough pride, but it's not excess pride hubris, hubris, you know, they're, they're ambitious, but they're not blind ambition where they're going to kind of kill their mother for a quarter. Right. So it's like, again, you got to balance things. Um, yeah. So it's, I would say pride, but cautious, cautiously, you know? Yeah, I also appreciate the uh, the hockey analogies every now and then as well. Uh, I think it's I really like right there. <laughs> I know very much so. In what ways has the pandemic affected uh, your business dealings with with WatchMojo.com and the way content's being put out? I want to ask more generally with digital media, but to just kind of start off, I will kind of want to know how it's affected your business. So we're again very lucky. Uh, we were able to transition very quickly to work from home. This was something that a few years ago, especially when I brought on my chief financial officer, I kind of given his background said, look, I go, I'm a CXO. I'm kind of touching on everything, but I'm, I'm here to support everybody. It's, it's like your show. But I said, I also think given your background, you should wear the mantle of a chief information officer. So we started uh, company-wide to say, what are some processes that we could kind of move to the cloud and work remotely and as, to scale our operation, you know, if we wanted to add more global employees, how could they access things uh, from afar? So we started this a few years ago, um, but I would say we were maybe 70, 80% there. You know, when, when the pandemic started, um, uh, you know, I grew up in Canada, but I was born in Iran where there was a lot of cases. So I would kind of, in the headlines, I would kind of read about that. And then I, you know, I have a colleague who lives in Italy and I think Iran and Italy, the connection was through China. Uh, they're, they both do a lot of trade with China. But so I could see that this was going to travel and it hit me when I was in LA and the Uber driver said, you know, Ashkin, uh, have you been to, Ch I coughed just very nice. I was like, uh -uh, one cough. And she was like, have you been to China? And I was like, no, I haven't been to China, but that got me thinking more and more. So I pushed my team to say, let's go the full 20 yards now. Let's get from 80% to 100% readiness so we could basically move and work from home. And by the time March 12th, my birthday, coincidentally, when uh, Premier Logo said, uh, you got to shut down and work from home, we were able to get half the company to work from home the next day. Uh, sorry, that, that was when the schools shut down. It still was not for, the, they, we were far ahead. And then 20, uh, 48 hours later, we had the rest, the, the remaining 50% of the team work from home. And we just had to do a, a couple of additional switches. And we basically, um, and uh, we basically just kind of ensured that the, the, the team was in a, in a good state of mind because a lot of them are young, which is good on the sense of they don't have kids. So they weren't like tripling up as parents and teachers and employees, but it also means that they're alone at home. So, you know, it's, it's kind of like solitude. Some people react really well to that. Some people get almost depressed. So I also told my team, I said, we're very lucky. Operationally, we're fine. Viewers can come and, you know, walk into our virtual store, so to speak. We're very lucky. But I was like, let's not have a cookie cutter uh, mental state policy that thinking everybody's going to be affected the same way. Let's actually kind of try to identify who is affected. And maybe some of those things are addressed through technology. You know, if somebody is frustrated because their internet speed is low, maybe we just pay for their upgrade. But if somebody else is like, I can't work alone, I get depressed and have suicidal thoughts, which is nothing to make light of. I was like, we need to zoom in on that person and maybe check in on them once a week. And even if it's socially distanced, just walk by and say hi and stuff, right? And we can allow ourselves to do that because we're like 50 full time, we're not 500 people. So we are very fortunate. We're very lucky that as a business, we can move to work from home. And then as a company, we always kind of cared about people, you know, and so we, we, it was kind of a seamless change for us. And I think in media, You've just seen an acceleration um, of, you know, all of a sudden, if before you were a writer living in Boise, Idaho, you, you had to maybe move to New York to get a job in media. I think that is probably dissipated. Now you can more or less work from anywhere. And I think management is more open to that. You know, I think corporations are very paranoid. They don't really trust their employees, unfortunately. So I think some of that is more like, oh, we just need to make sure we could surveil everybody. Um, but yeah, so so long story short, we were lucky. And I think at a higher macro level, you're just seeing um, effectively what was going to happen in the next 10 years happen now uh, in a span of one year. What I'm also curious about with regards to uh, operating digital media in the pandemic, I'm thinking about, I I'm lucky and fortunate enough where I'm still finding work, uh, not just with CTV, but some of the other places I have under my resume, but for students, specifically journalism or communication students who 
are leaving the school, leaving school and, and trying to enter the workforce now. Like w- when you see what's going on with some of these digital media properties as they're trying to handle themselves in this pandemic, uh, I mean, we're not students right now, but ca- how, how do you feel about students trying to enter this weird time right now? I don't doubt that it's challenging just because everything is a bit more complicated and I do respect that. And I think that's just a sign of you needing persistence and resiliency and being creative. So I don't want to discount the challenge. I don't want to be sitting here going, oh, it's easy. It's hard. I get it. But it's a greater, at a big level, big, big picture, it's a better opportunity for you to be entering the workforce now because the status quo is shattered. Whereas a year ago, you'd go in and and apply, people were very comfortable in their ways. I think today, everybody realizes that they need to change, they need to adapt, they need to just, you know, think differently. So one, it's, that's just a good time for new fresh blood, you know, two, uh, I also think that, you know, whenever you are an incumbent, whenever you are an established player, you, you kind of feel like business is, um, you know, you kind of feel like your, your business is set in its way and you could just kind of ride the wave. I think now you could come in and propose new ideas and better ways of doing things and people will probably listen to you. And then third, mainly, is you no longer are limited to Montreal jobs. If, you're, if you went to Concordia and you were physically bound to Montreal, I mean, this was even pre-pandemic, you could apply for a job more or less everywhere. But I think some of those jobs were still in freelance and not that there's anything wrong with freelance, but I think it was still limited in terms of not all the jobs were open. I think now you're just going to see more jobs open. You know, So if you're in Montreal, you could probably apply for jobs in Toronto or New York or Chicago or even LA, uh, even globally. So it does create a lot of opportunity, but you have to be creative, right? I mean, nobody is actually sitting there thinking about you. And I know that's a bit harsh to hear. Nobody is sincerely, earnestly looking for solutions to your problem. And that was probably the best thing I learned very quickly when I got into Concordia. You know, Concordia overall for me was a great experience, but it was a very sobering experience. You know, I saw the politics. I saw the red tape. I saw people's true colors. And I was grateful for that. I wasn't like, oh, it's unfair. There are things that I saw that probably happened in other colleges and other organizations. And the same way that I learned things to do, I also learned things not to do. But it was ultimately that I realized that I had to be creative and find solutions for my problems uh, while solving other people's problems. And if I could do that, I felt that I would have a successful career. And if I've had a relatively speaking decent career, It's because of those two things. I'm always trying to solve other people's pain points. I'm always trying to come up with solutions. Now, what I've learned is, Julian, you're you're a young man, but when I was your age, I was probably so much more like that. And one thing I've learned with age, with wisdom, I used to have hair like you. No, it's, it's okay to let the puck come to you sometimes. You know, what was Wayne Gretzky really good for? He would go behind the net But he would actually just put his stick down and the puck would then kind of come to him as he then moved in front. When you try too hard and when you chase some things, you also sometimes end up maybe not getting those things, right? So, but those are all things you learn and you adapt. But I would say it is the greatest time to be entering the workforce now because there's just this massive turnover and change of older people also heading out and retiring. Don't go to, don't go to where the puck is, go to where the puck is going, right? That's what uh, Wayne's father told him. There you go, and that's what go. every and that's what every venture capitalist uh, refers to in their decks somewhere. That's what they all want to. And I go, oh, I'm Canadian. I'm like, I know about that line. Don't worry. <laughs> that line, or uh, you miss a hundred percent of the shots you don't take. Absolutely. What's Michael Jordan's best line? Uh, I succeed every day because I fail every day. You know what I mean? Like. I sometimes laugh when my colleagues, they'll, you know, we have a very flat culture. People, I, I surround myself with people who respectfully call me out, challenge me and say, no, there's a better way of doing things, Asher. I see what you want to do. Let's do it this way. But sometimes they'll say, they'll be a bit more like, well, you know, we tried this and it didn't work. I'm like, but look, you exist in this company because we took a, a chance on you. So why is it okay that we took a chance on you and it took time to work? But when I try certain other things and it doesn't work, it's like, oh, you know what I mean? That I, and then they kind of get it. That I'm like, 
it's that willingness to always try. It's like that belief that you're going to play your best game tomorrow um, that keeps you going as an entrepreneur. Man, I want to play a game right now. Uh, let's let's look ahead to the future here. And you actually kind of mentioned it in one of your previous answers in terms of how uh, the pandemic has kind of brought a lot of digital media properties to where they were likely going to be in five, 10 years, where a lot of stuff is not necessarily outsourced, but we're in a situation now where you can kind of do stuff remotely. Uh, is that ultimately going to be the future of digital media? Is there any other thing that you're, you're, you're anticipating will happen within the next decade or so? I think you're seeing like five or six trend lines where the lines got mixed up and it's admittedly unclear which one will supersede. Let me explain. One of them has been just, you know, content, like there's three C's on the internet. There's content, commerce, and community. Content has effectively moved online. Now. Like that's, you know, people don't necessarily read the Gazette in print. They'll, no disrespect to CTV and CBC, people still tune into that. But by and large, even the content that we used to watch on TV, you've seen with Netflix and YouTube and Disney Plus, it's moved online. Commerce has been crushing it more and more, but commerce really only 10 to 15% of all commerce was happening online. And what's happened is in the pandemic year, it's grown more than it did all of the last 10 years. So commerce is going to continue. And obviously community has flourished online going back to day one. However, there's been a lot of these things a few people asked about AI, AR, VR. These are all buzzwords. But the same way, like right now, you'll hear about fintech. I think it's like technology. At some point, there's no such thing as a technology company because all companies are technology companies or all companies leverage technology to enable what they used to do in a more analog way. You know, I assure you, you could knock FedEx or UPS because they were late to deliver a package for you one time. But those are impressive, digitally connected organizations that are technology companies. You know what I mean? Like, I'm baffled. I'm like, how do they know where this box is? You know, <laughs> I'm a simple man, yeah. you know. But so it's the same thing with AI. It's the same thing with AR, VR. So I do think, though, that like even things like visiting homes you know, you started visiting a home or a condo, maybe with video or FaceTime. But I do think, well, you're going to be able to visit the mall through some form of um, AR, where you can basically walk around an apartment, so you don't need to go and visit it, right? So what is going to happen now is these companies are just going to shift a disproportionate amount of their budgets to these things. If you were uh, the president of Jean Coutu, uh, a, a year ago, you would have given maybe a $2 million budget to your VP of retail to go open a new store. And you were like, you know what? I want to be on the corner of Mont Royal and Saint Denis. It's humming. Let's get that old uh, Rapido restaurant and turn it into another Pharma Prix or Jean Coutu because that's where the action is. This year, the president goes, Johnny, we're not going to do that. I miss Rapido so much. I see <laughs> other people with fine taste. Um, but Maybe Johnny doesn't get that $2 million, but the president will give Rochelle um, you know, $500,000 to build a better store experience. Or they'll tell whomever was in charge of just planning out the floor plans to say, you know what, maybe it's more a uh, curbside pickup. So the experiences are now going to change very quickly. The budgets are going to change very quickly, right? And that, I think, is just what happens in war, pandemics. These shocks to the system just serve as accelerators of history. That's what Lenin used to say. You don't have to agree with what Lenin's political views were, but from like a historian perspective, that's what pandemics and wars and famines do. They just accelerate things that were going to happen, but at a slower pace. I believe we've reached the uh, portion of our discussion where we can take questions from the audience. Uh, we know a lot of people have been uh, vibing a lot in the uh, the chat. We've had some questions come to us even before this uh, discussion even began. Um, let's see if it's worth uh, going through some of the pre uh, the pre chat ones first. Let me pull one up from uh, Linda Chen. Advice on starting in digital media industry. Is it beneficial to have an ongoing side personal project to add onto your CV when applying to jobs? And how do hiring managers view this? 
Good question. Very appropriate for the times. I think you should always, if you're, t- first of all, entrepreneurship is a privilege. Uh, you know, it's, it's a lot of things, but you, not, if you're like a single mother working two jobs while going to school, it's obviously not easy to have a side hustle. So let's please on the record say that that's not realistic for all. But look, I think you should all be doing something that touches on what I said, you know, like the, do you have a comparative advantage? Is the demand supply in your favor? Can you earn a living, whether through entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship, or a job? I think those, and then yet you're passionate about for for bonus, obviously, but that's key. I think those three or four tests, you should all be doing something like that. Even if it's stamp collecting, why? Because online with global reach, you could build a, you can be the Bill Gates of stamps. So yes, you should do that. However, your question shows a bias that again means you have to work for an organization. You know, 30, 40 years ago, every kid was like, I'm going to be a doctor because that's what my mom wants. Or I'm going to be a professor because that's what my dad did. You know, like there's always this, these insecurities and these things that we latch on to for, for more traditional reasons. Today, not everybody's an entrepreneur, but everybody has to be entrepreneurial because corporations don't want to retain you guys. I know it sounds harsh. That's why I don't want to go work for a company. You know, I wanted to do things differently. Corporations, unfortunately, look at their people. They'll say you're our greatest assets, but they're also looking to automate that and get those costs out. You know, so I do think, though, that like it's important for you all to have a backup plan. And I do think the side hustle helps. Now, during an interview process, it does show initiative. It also gives you a bit more leverage. Why? You probably will not be able to start something like that if you start a company, if you start a a job, because they might think it's competitive or a distraction, but at least having it before shows them that maybe you have a, a, a bit more options and then that you've been doing it anyway. And frankly, you know, I'm always blown away. And I say this very respectfully, Concordia and all academic institutions prepare you overall pretty well, but I'm also blown away by how ill prepared a lot of graduate students are. You know, they've never learned how to invoice. They've never learned about taxes. We have to tell them for invoicing purposes, use this template. You see this line about taxes. Do you know what your tax situation is, right? So long story short, I think the more you do some kind of side personal project, inadvertently, you're also further educating yourself on things like technology and administration and other things that are only going to help you regardless of whether you work for somebody or whether you work for yourself. And by the way, when you're an entrepreneur, you basically work for others as well, but it's just a different dynamic. I'm going to take another uh, pre-chat question here from Arun Dayanandan. As a biologist and science communicator, I experiment with various digital storytelling strategies for communicating conservation theme messages. What advice do you have for science storytellers to get their message across in the digital era? So for science, there's two questions there, I feel. One is more the science theme and the other one, I think, so that's content. And then the other one is the distribution, the, the, the message across communicating. So that's more distribution, a last mile. I would say that it's a great era to be talking about facts and science related because you could leverage a pretty efficient and effective uh, multimedia. You know, you could either, you know, learn how to design some of those visuals that you would need to convey that, but there's a lot of cheap, almost free stock media and stock uh, videos that you could probably use. And if you're comfortable around fair use, which is not for everybody, you could also use fair use if you're creating, and if it's science, it'll probably be educational content. So I think it's a great era. And I think that as much as we talk and heard about fake news and this and that, look, look at the Khan Academy, K-H-A-N, uh, you know, they, they built this empire around uh, the, the thirst for educational info The only tip I would give you is think of it more as a global, meaning, sure, there could be some voiceover that's in English, but make sure your content can translate globally. Um, And in fact, we have a channel unveiled where, you know, if you're interested, by all means, reach out to me. And and we are looking at creating more content in that vertical. The second point is more regarding distribution. So venture capitalists talk a lot about product market fit, uh, where you got to tinker your product with regards to pricing, packaging, et cetera to nail it and adapt it to a market, right? Um, And so in content, I I refer to that concept as platform format fit. In other words, you could have 
a great science message, but it's up to you to tinker and figure out what does that content look like on Facebook versus YouTube versus Twitter on your own blog versus TikTok, et cetera, et cetera. And what you will see is before you take 10 steps on the content front, take one or two steps on the content front and then take a step into on distribution. Play with that formula, play with the length, play with the style. Maybe you put voiceover, maybe you shouldn't put voiceover. Maybe you only used images, maybe you need a graph, maybe it's a whiteboard. So in competition, another oncoming sports analogy, it's like the line of scrimmage. You could win on the defensive side on the ball. You could also win naturally on the offensive side on the ball. In the media game, you have to hatch a strategy for your content that reflects distribution at a given time. And that's what we did. Our content was tailored for YouTube. Uh, this next question is from the chat, and uh, it's a sports one uh, from Andrew Maggio. Uh, he says, "Our hockey, the hockey analogies were on point, so I made sure to mention that. As a digital media expert, I'm curious about your thoughts on the possibility that the Big Two, which you refer to as the NFL and the NBA, might use the upcoming broadcasting rights negotiations to shift to streaming platforms such as Amazon, YouTube, or even Apple TV, more exclusively uh, similar, and it's a bit similar, obviously, to DAZN here in Canada. In a few weeks, the uh, Saturday afternoon game between the San Francisco 49ers and the Arizona Cardinals is going to be exclusively broadcast on Amazon, except in both local markets. That makes me think of when Yahoo was streaming uh, some of those games going on in London. Do you see this as feasible? Is cord cutting uh, a real threat to the way sports have been traditionally consumed? And do you see all these leagues moving to streaming only one day? I have my thoughts on that. I'm very curious about yours. Well, look, I think there's two different uh, answers there, uh, because if you are the NFL, you know, the big kahuna, it's a very different reality than if you are the NHL, like candidly, you know, like so we for us, NHL is, you know, the Pope. But in America, obviously, the NHL is not the NFL. So if you are the NFL, um, I think you'll be able to have your cake and eat it, too. I think you'll still want the big event like TV phenomenon and that you might be able to, you know, you know, skin the cat in different ways to be able to say, I'm going to give, like you alluded to certain games to streaming, certain games to cable and network, because you still want the massive reach that you really only get on TV for sports, live sports. But the reality is, not all those matches are those big main events. And the relative value to an Amazon, and it's really mainly Amazon, I don't think Facebook will care as much, nor do I think Netflix wants to be in sports. So it'll whittle, whittle down to maybe YouTube. YouTube is interested, but not the same way Amazon will be. Um, so I think what will happen is there'll be, it'll just be more, a bit more of a carve out for the longest time. But there is no doubt that if you are, um, you know, commissioner at, at the NFL, you want to be more global and you're only going to get that through streaming. So you have to somehow mid-flight change that jet engine where you keep one engine on TV for the profile and all that. But then you take another engine and you basically give that up to, to streaming because you'll get in aggregate more revenue and also an aggregate more reach. But if you are the NFL, you'll, you'll be able to do it in a certain way. Like you'll, you'll be able to put a piece of paper in front and say, this is what it'll take. Whereas if you're the NHL, you'll probably have to give your first and second born child and second round draft pick to make anything happen. <laughs> Jeez, Brilliant. that's you're from, that's from, that's from the NHL. I mean, my whole big thing on on the fact that uh, so many people are quarter cutting as it is, I always think back to uh, the stat that uh, I think ESPN was available or was in about 100 million households at the beginning of last decade. And that number has just kind of dwindled down to probably below 90 million, probably closer to 85 million around this time. It's just clear to me now, and you've, you've alluded to it at different points in our conversation, that so many more people are cutting the cord and feel they don't need a bloated cable bill to 
watch the content that they want to watch. And I know you were saying earlier, like, no offense to CTV and CBC. I know I, I work, uh, you know, with CTV doing weather and other reporting stuff, but I, I see it too. Like, and, and, and those different companies as well, they, they, they realize that the market for them is, is dwindling a little bit and they're trying to emphasize a lot more online. So definitely, I think, uh, I don't know how far it'll go. I think once, I think once Amazon or one of those internet companies gets gets themselves their hands on on a really good deal for for streaming a particular sport then we're just going to see like a damn kind of burst here that's my thought about it but i think right now we're still at that calm before the storm do we have time for one more question i know we're, yeah, we're coming up on two o'clock no problem uh we'll, we'll we can answer one or two more questions okay cool um i'm gonna go back into the chat and let's see if we can pull up one here from Krista Halton. Do you think YouTube is at its peak or is there more room for opportunity and growth? YouTube's grown quite a bit, right? It's got 2 billion users, you know, if you just, and it's banned in China. So if you do the math, there is a level of saturation from a user growth perspective, it will continue to grow. And, you know, as kids get older, you know, they'll move from TikTok and Roblox to YouTube. But, but from a user perspective, it is, it, is, it is hard. Any given Sunday, those inches are harder to attain. However, growth is a function of users, but also monetization and engagement. So as there's more and more content and more and more people now, like uh, 10 years ago when we set our sights on YouTube, you know, if we did top 10 Beyonce songs, we were the only kind of legit Beyonce content on the platform because Beyonce wasn't putting her music videos on YouTube. And otherwise it was just some guy talking about why he loved Beyonce. It wasn't like, you know, so, so we stood out, but now Beyonce's, uh, she communicates with her fans through YouTube and they're all embracing YouTube. But monetization, there's still a lot of growth. What does that mean? What did I start off with? The dam is broken. The $75 billion from TV are going to flow to uh, streaming. Streaming is AVOD, Advertising Video On Demand, which YouTube is, and SVOD, Subscription Video On Demand, which Netflix is. Netflix, no ads. So all that ads are going to kind of like create a bottleneck and flow through YouTube's pipes. So YouTube now is generating in a quarter what TV companies generate in a year. You know, so YouTube generating 15 to 20 billion dollars and growing at 25% per, per annum is more than all of the TV companies put together. So there's still a lot more growth for YouTube overall in aggregate. But as a creator, admittedly, it is hard to reach an audience on YouTube. Uh, it's just there's way too much competition and clutter. So I think whereas you should also always think about your YouTube strategy, you may be better off thinking of other platforms, whether it's Snap, TikTok, Facebook, whatever, Triller, where you'll be able to find an audience uh, because the world is a very fragmented place. Here's for you, Ash, from Norm. Uh, actually about a series of different questions here, but uh, they were pretty light. I'm actually really curious about this one. How did you come up with the name Watch Mojo and how does Watch Mojo make money? Who comprises your audience and followers, age group, et cetera? Sure. So let's start with the money question right away. So I'm not hiding it. Uh, we, everything is, there's an advertiser behind it, but it's mainly YouTube and Snap, like those platforms where we put our content, they sell the ads, we get a cut. We also work with brands who sometimes want to work with us directly. It's a smaller piece of the business. And then we have media companies who may want to license our content to put it like, so airlines and portals and whatnot. But the bulk of it is ad supported that the partner sells. In terms of the name, look, in the late 90s, I won't lie, I was watching Austin Powers and he was saying Mojo and the name just stuck in my head. I was thinking of Mojo Supreme, which sounds like a taco from Taco Bell, maybe. The name stuck in my head and I forgot about it. Um, you know, to me, Mojo was not, it wasn't like anything chauvinistic. It was more like aura, charisma, confidence. Um, if you look up the origins of the world, that's what it connotes. And I also like that it had a double entendre for mobile journalism, which is what we were basically doing. We were kind of nomads roaming the streets of Montreal, uh, coming up with uh, content. But so when then it came time to launch Watch Mojo, 
because it was like watching content and also just watch, because again, I had something to prove to the world maybe, we went with Watch Mojo um, and it stuck. And uh, yeah, and so our audience predominantly is American, male, you know, 80% male. I would say it goes from 12 years to 65, but specifically 16 to 34 years old is our sweet spot. And then Miss Mojo is the same, but female uh, viewership is a bit higher. LGBT is probably 10, 15% on our Watch Mojo channel and probably good 25, 35% on Miss Mojo, which is pretty uh, consistent with, you know, how that demographic breaks down. Ash, this was really interesting. This was really awesome to do again honored that I was able to, to moderate this panel with you, man. This was really awesome. And thank you to everyone uh, who contributed questions through chat or beforehand. And a uh, big shout out to Concordia for having us both uh, moderate this event. This was very special and this was very fun. Thank you all so much for tuning into our webinar this afternoon. Don't be too modest. Tonight, I'll point to the TV and tell my daughters, hey, I was on, I was interviewing that guy. Point Friday. I'm on Friday. <laughs> Thank you both so much. Um, we really, and thank you for taking the time out of your day to join us. We're so pleased to have two Concordia alumni leading the conversation on this topic.